Okay, today we are with uh, Diederik Venendel. Okay, he's a structural engineer and, and founder of Sumum Engineering. And we are uh, very happy here at the master uh, to have him as the first lecturer in the architecture and computation series. We have been following the work uh, from Diederik, at least in my case, for 20 years. He was doing like a flex, uh, flexible uh, formwork for uh, concrete. And for me, it has been like really, really inspiring. Everything has been uh, publishing. Everything I have seen from his work, just a, a little part. I have been always been uh, very inspired. So we are very happy that he's uh, here with us. Okay, so Diederik, uh, welcome and all yours. Thank you. Uh, OK, thanks for the introduction. Enrique, it's uh, nice to speak to all of you. Um, let me start by introducing some engineering. Uh, so yes, I founded it five years ago, uh, but it's a, it's a small team. Uh, right now we're the six um, like, uh, international backgrounds. Uh, Rick and I are Dutch, the rest are from different countries, including uh, Aito from Spain, who's an alumnus from uh, MPDA, from UPC. Um, a little bit about myself, I, uh, I studied civil engineering in Delft, uh, worked as a structural engineer at Witteveen Bos for a while, then did my PhD and did research in, uh, in Switzerland at ETH Zurich. And then five years ago, I returned to uh, Netherlands and founded some engineering in, uh, in Rotterdam. Um, it's a small firm because we, we focus on very specific things. Uh, you might call them niche. We don't do uh, things that you might consider like standard engineering. Uh, but whatever we do, it's kind of uh, possible to categorize them in at least one of these four, uh, four groups of projects, um, lightweight structures, uh, digitally fabricated structures, so working with people who use digital fabrication, um, structures that are made from natural or bio-based materials, uh, beyond timber, so that could also include uh, uh, bamboo or, or, or straw. Um, and increasingly uh, reclaimed and circular material. So uh, just a quick idea of each um, lightweight structures like this, air inflated halls for winter season to cover a sports field so you can continue playing sports and training. Uh, digitally fabricated structures like this conceptual idea for uh, an Earth's uh, robotically sprayed earthen noise barrier. Um, natural bio-based materials like uh, engineered uh, cross-laminated timber. Uh, this is floating home, uh, completed this year in, in, in the city of Leiden, Netherlands. And then circular elements, uh, also not always in the role of uh, structural engineer, sometimes just parametric modeling. This is for the facade of the, the Warren in, in uh, Amsterdam. It's a render, but uh, the residents expect to, to be in by, by Christmas. Uh, they're already like painting. The exterior facade is made from uh, reclaimed timber. So timber that uh, that's getting a second life. And our role was to kind of optimize the, the layout from existing beams and how to saw them into the pieces for, for the facade structure. Um, I talked to Enrique what, what would interest you guys. Um, so I, I picked out four projects uh, that I also have enough to show on. Um, Two timber projects, uh, a grid shell in Sweden, um, some unusual timber objects in, in the Philippines connected by hanging bridges, um, a 3D printed concrete pedestrian bridge, and a uh, more experimental 3D concrete printed uh, vault. Um, I, I have some videos in, in this presentation. Uh, whenever I do an online talk, it, it may or may not work. So I, I included some photos if it's if the video doesn't work or if it's too choppy, and I'll, I'll send and we get the the links to the videos which are online, so you can also have a look afterwards. Um, the first one uh, is the Portalen Pavilion. It's a, a grid shell in in the city of uh, North in, in in Sweden. Uh, it's a grid shell, quite traditional uh, in the sense traditional that it refers to the work of, uh, of Fry Otto and uh, the seminal uh, multi-halle in, in Mannheim. Um, the idea of a grid shell, uh, probably given your studies, I'm, I'm sure you've had it in lectures or maybe even like designing one, I'm not sure. Um, but for those who might not know, it's uh, making a flat grid of, of timber and then, and then deforming it somehow into its shape. 
Um, so the Mannheim in Nottel is a great inspiration to me because it, it was a time when, when people both did physical modeling, but it's also the time when you had the first computational modeling. Uh, so both were done for, for the multi -hulle. Um So uh, this, is, this is Sweden. This is the city of Norrköping and in, in one of the outer areas. Uh, there's a community center for uh, recent immigrants to integrate into the labor market. And outside of this center, there's a park where they wanted to build a pavilion to host outdoor events, anything from workshops, uh, cultural workshops like, uh, like dancing, community workshops. Um, so they reached out to Map13 from Barcelona, who were famous for doing brick vaults. The idea was to make a, a Catalan vault. But the soil conditions were so poor that quite quickly uh, the decision was made to uh, turn it into something lighter. So uh, the idea came up of a uh, um, uh, of a timber grid shell. So um, I was good friends with uh, uh, David Lopez Lopez uh, from Map 14. He asked me to help them with both form finding and uh, engineering of this thing. And I involved my friend Edith uh, Augustinovich, who's now a, a professor of timber digital fabrication uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so, so this video, um, Enrique, can you comment? Is this visible for you guys, or is it very choppy? It's it's perfect. It's running perfect. Okay, so this gives an idea of the the form finding process. It's it's from a flat sheet of, uh, of uh, finding a surface, mapping a grid on it using this compass method that. That was developed in 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 the seventies for these earlier project by by Fiotto and 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 his team. Um, of course, this is the computational equivalent of it. Um, and the nice thing is it it fed directly into the engineering. So initial preliminary engineering in in Karamba and then onto uh, more sophisticated analysis in in Sophistic. Um, leading up to the actual uh, construction. Um, so just some ideas from the drawings. Still have to produce 2D drawings for permit submissions. Uh, I'm not sure if that's ever going to go away. Um, some drawings from Map 13. Uh, just some idea of the, the engineering. You have to deal with things that are not really well-defined in code. You try to adopt uh, things from code for arches to figure out how to deal with uh, uh, engineering these things. Uh, most structures that you see around you are limited by deflections and, and strength, but a, a thing like a shell like this is, is really defined by its buckling behavior. Um, so there's also all, all sorts of things that come into play. Um, some, some quick engineering facts, um, spruce grid, laminated timber uh, edges, the cladding polycarbonate for, for daylight entry. It's very low weight, six kilo, kilograms per square meter, not uh, cubic meter. Uh, snow loads, very high for what I'm used to. Uh, so 200 kilos per square meter of snow in this part of Sweden, which is low for Sweden because in the south. Um, you have to deal with, with uh, how the timber creeps and how it affects the, the uh, bending it into its shape. And then this problem of buckling loads, which is not governed by by uh, code. So the best we could do was refer to papers around the multi hollow how they approached it, and try to achieve at least the same uh, margins of safety. Um, we we did this sophisticated model, taking into account all sorts of things that are relevant in a grid shell uh, and the way it is made. Uh, and then the awkward thing is that the engineering was was cut after the permit phase, and then the contractor brought in its own timber engineer who redid the analysis, but without all these kind of effects. And as a result of that, um, uh, uh, the grid turned out to be 30% heavier than the way we calculated it. So um, if you if you don't take all these nonlinearities into to account, like how, how this thing behaves under increasing uh, increasing loads uh it, it 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 turns out to be the analysis suggests that it's much more rigid than it really is and if it's much more rigid it, it is much more stress and if it's much more stress you need much more wood to to counteract it so um so that's unfortunate if if, if you're not involved from beginning to end that that you get these kind of differences of opinion and and that tend to be uh more conservative um 
interestingly, the contractor also decided to not make it actually as a deployable grid, but to make a guide work and just put the, the timber lathes in one by one. Um, so this is kind of how they built it. Uh, also quite practical given the size, it's something like uh, 200, 300 square meters. Um, but it was surprising to us. We, we designed everything for it to be made from a flat grid. And then in the end, it was made like this. It was quite funny. Um, so some idea of the final structure. Again, I'll, I'll share the links with Enrique about these videos. So uh, I'll just give you some, some first impressions of how it looks in the site and its surroundings. Uh, they put a timber floor in. Uh, and so I still follow the community center on Instagram and there's like really nice events that they do. Uh, new mothers with their babies, old people learning to tango, uh, little concerts. It's really nice to see, to not only work on, on something uh, that is interesting from an engineering or architectural standpoint, but also to see it, its result really being used so well uh, by, by, by local people. So another, some ideas of the grid, the polycarbonate tiling, the final result. Um, uh, second project um, is the Domes Village um, in New Clark City in Philippines. I, he I heard a sound. Uh, Enrico, you still everyone there, right? People commenting in the chat. Ah, OK, OK. S um, saying, saying lovely. Oh. Um, just let me know if, if people want to do a Q&A per project or after, because otherwise I'll just keep going. But uh, don't don't uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, the Domes Village in New Clark City in the Philippines. New Clark City. Maybe I'll tell a little bit more. This is together with um, Super Project. There's two uh, Dutch um, designers, one of whom has strong ties with the Philippines, and a local artist called Bernardo Packwing. Um, it's four objects. One is clearly inspired by a geodesic dome from uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, who, who really popularized uh, and developed these kind of uh, grids. Um, other objects had different sources of inspiration. Uh, the other three objects were designed by, by uh, this artist, Bernardo Packwing. He is inspired by natural objects. So he did these previous things like this one. And uh, together with these two Dutch designers, Thijs Ewalds and, and Jasper Niens, um, they had this initial idea of these multiple objects connected by uh, suspended or like hanging, hanging bridges. Um, so New Clark City, uh, north of Manila, north in the Philippines, it's a new city uh, that's been under development for several years. It includes um, a kind of a central river park and along this park, a uh, uh, new areas with with lots of art installations and so one area was dedicated to to our team um, uh, so like i said this th there's four objects three of them by bernardo this is the first one the coral dome inspired by coral reef and like these seps of a particular kind of of, of coral um, the second one uh the natural dome it's kind of uh a a spherical object it doesn't work like a dome as you can see it has an internal uh, beam and post uh, structure but uh, completely clad with uh, kind of random random elements um what's interesting to note that all this timber you can see it it's, it's repurposed it's from old timber housing and other sources just bought in in, in bulk and then kind of used by this local team of of uh of, of philippine carpenters um connected with CNC cut steel nodes, like uh, produced in Manila. So it had this w interesting combination of local uh, carpentry and uh, digital CNC production for the steel to tie it all together. Um, yeah, and this is the final object, more geometrical. Um, it starts from a typical um, icosahedron and you can kind of see where this geodesic shape from Buckminster Fuller is coming from. We kind of deformed it to allow for one of these bridges to connect to it, so you can actually enter it uh, at a higher level. Um, inside, the, the idea was to put in a rope net, but unfortunately, that kind of like got 
cut from the from the final project. So uh, now it just leads into the geodesic dome. You have a little a few steps down. Uh, these are some of these CNC cut nodes uh, customized for each position, uh, depending also the amount of force in each um, in each element. Um, and then an indication of how this was organized on site. So we had a, a lot of digital design engineering happening here in Rotterdam, and then uh, people on site kind of uh, turning this into a uh, uh, whole plan for, for how to uh, sequence this. Um, and then tying these four objects together, uh, suspension bridges, also a big kind of puzzle. So all just timber carpenters. So everything was also quite surprising for them, but uh, just an amazing team. And they, they pulled this off together. Everything from concept to fabrication within the span of less than a year, because the park had to be finished for the opening of the Asian Games, it's kind of the Southeast Asian Olympics, uh, which was held in New Clark City. Um, some unusual facts, um, three types of local hardwood species, um, steel and wire rope. Philippines is interesting because they have building codes based on 1980s American standards. Um, and while the American standards have kind of progressed and also now usually adopt a limit state approach like uh, we do in Europe with the Eurocode, the Philippine standards kind of uh, is kind of like a time capsule. So I, I had a friend, an American engineer, Marianne uh, uh, Wachter, who um, who helped me because she kind of had these kind of things in, in in during her education. So she could help me to point to like these original sources of where some of these articles in the Philippine code were coming from. Um, so where the snow pressure in um, in, uh, in in Sweden was quite high. The wind pressure here was quite high because of hurricanes. Uh, again, this is on the lower end of the spectrum in in the Philippines, but much higher than what I'm used to uh, uh, for 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 structures in the Netherlands. Uh, similar also, uh, so about 200 kilos per square meters of of, of wind pressure. Um, so combining this this traditional carpentry with uh, computational modeling, translating these Philippine codes into parametric models to figure out uh, what the wind loads are. Uh, the timber was particularly interesting. We had these three species of reclaimed wood. So we had samples taken and tested by the FPRDI, that's a, a testing institute in, 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 in the Philippines related to the University of Manila. Uh, they did this testing and we got like these nice results. Okay, so these are, this is the bending stress, tension stress, uh, stiffness. Um, but, um, and, and the Philippine code had a, a section on timber, but nobody knew how to convert these testing results based on American standards to design values as they, uh, as you need to use them in the, calc uh, the, the equations in this Philippine code. Uh, so we had these kind of texts where we kind of realized that this testing institute didn't didn't know anything about how to convert their their results for for something that we could use, and we had to uh, like call around and dig into like local archives. Uh, some guys had to drive throughout the night to find some low library and and make hard copies of old papers. Uh, but in the end, it did lead us. Um, uh, to 1980s literature that that told us how this this code was supposed to be used to then derive design values that we could use according to the Philippine code. Now the reason is why why did nobody know this anymore? It's because uh, there are basically no more forests in the Philippines. So write uh, this code. All these things are from the 1980s. That's around the time that actually most of the the, the forests in Philippines were cut, uh, so unsustainably uh, forested. And nowadays, people don't want to live in timber anymore. There's no timber anyway. Uh, lots of things are being demolished and replaced by steel and concrete. And so you have all this reclaimed timber around. Nobody know, knows how to uh, work with it according to Philippine standards. Um, so that was quite unusual. I uh, wouldn't call it setback, but uh, a challenge during the, during the project. Um, it led ultimately to these kind of... Um, results where you could see according to philippine standards and our uh, our specific uh, timber uh, what the utilization was and uh, especially for the geodesic dome we tried to 
uh, follow forces by making sections bigger where you need them and smaller where they could be. Um, the whole thing was very guerrilla style. This is like uh, us asking them to test certain details. So this is in some metal workshop in Manila where they put a weight on it. And uh, you see a little bit of extra with a chicken just running around in the workshop, also adding to the testing weight. So nothing like a lot of things are very uh, on the fly and not very well standardized. And in many senses, uh, um, uh, in many respects, very different from a European situation, um, which is also something that I, I, I find interesting and in working in projects uh, all the way in the in the Philippines. Um, some of the results are very nice, like uh, these these uh, this detailing and how it comes together with this this hardwood um to give you an idea of how everything together looks um this is this is somewhat just slightly before the pandemic uh so there's there's people first visitors around we we they did have the opening at the asian games where these bridges were full of people uh it then closed down for a while and they had some uh, like little reopening uh after the pandemic um uh there's no restrictions now in, in the Philippines either. Uh, so very, yeah, alien-like weird objects. Uh, very unusual. Challenging to, to engineer. And then this final geodesic dome. Um, so, so this is uh, one, two, three, and four all together. Um, Going to ask if you're still there. Yes, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. As um, I'm going to keep asking because it's always a bit weird to sit in my room talking to a screen and I'm just assuming everybody's still following. <laughs> um, Next one. So we're changing from from timber to 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 printed concrete. This was um, uh, it didn't have a more apt name than the bridge project, uh, designed by Michiel van der Klei, uh, uh, a designer here in in the Netherlands. I was uh, invited along with uh, by Witveen Bosmaim, like where I used to work when I started out. Um, they were doing the engineering and they were asking me to do the parametric modeling for this thing. So one of the things that I uh, did was develop, um, uh, I don't think if this one is working, ah, it is, uh, developing a, um, a model where the logic of the designer was maintained, but it had enough uh, possibilities to change all sorts of aspects of the geometry while maintaining like a yeah, robust geometrical output. Um, the reason for this level of flexibility is, on the one hand, the client with Dutch government wanted potentially to make more bridges for different site conditions so that, that the bridge would have to change its form. But also because it was, um, I think, only the second 3D printed bridge in the Netherlands under development. Uh, kind of ultimately, it was the third to be built. Um, there, uh, yeah, there was, there was the need to, uh, this is another video. Um, there was the 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 possibility of that that things might not be uh, fabricatable, manufacturable by the three printing uh, company. It was the first prototypes were made by by TU Eindhoven, uh, Eindhoven University of Technology, but it, it was supposed to be tendered out to a commercial party, and we didn't know what kind of printer they would have, what kind of capabilities. So so this bridge might have to change. Um, ultimately, we could stick quite close to uh well, i guess you already saw this um to the design um which was let me cycle back a bit um so this is this is trying to stick close to the original design by michael van der klei uh we didn't have to deviate too much we still had a lot of like parametric modeling in there in terms of determining the size of the printed blocks uh, so the, the idea was to uh print it off-site and then, uh, yeah, develop 
automatically the from this model the the curves for uh, for printing so so the parametric model was kind of the bottleneck in the project in, um, so everything came together but also then diverged from there the model produced three kinds of geometry um, meshes for uh, structural analysis surfaces for uh, plan drawings for permitting again uh, and curves that were direct input for uh, for uh, the robots to print, the, the printer in Eindhoven from the university and later from uh, Bam Weber, uh, a contractor and a, a material supplier that that, that um, uh, started a, a commercial printing facility also in Eindhoven. Uh, an idea of the, yeah, the, how it came together. So it's, it's kind of five spans of individual blocks pre-stressed together and then lowered onto these 3D printed legs. Um, so you can either see it as a long one long bridge of 29 meters, still the longest one in the world uh, made with 3D concrete printing, uh, or uh, five individual small bridges. You can kind of see how it's, it's in one of the outer uh, suburbs of, of Nijmegen, a city in the east of the Netherlands. Um, then this is an early uh, testing prototype from the university being tested. Uh, again, the printing on site in parts, pre-stressed together. You see the, these black bits at the end of the bridges, which are the, the ends of the pre-stressing tendons, uh, bridge as a whole, and then final situation. Then the last project, um, Huizen Printers, Dutch for house printers. Uh, house printers is a group of companies in the Netherlands that, that got a, a grant to develop uh, 3D printing concrete technology. Um, they set out to, to print houses, but start with uh, something simpler, a, a small pavilion. Uh, I was brought on board by Jelle Veringa. Uh, he's, um, He's a designer, architectural background. Uh, he, he's, he's been CTO of multiple companies that, that have kind of pioneered robotics and architecture. Uh, Jelle invited me on board for to help with uh, parametric modeling and also do the engineering. Um, the shape for this pavilion, we were kind of free to, to propose something. We, we wanted to do something vaulted, inspired by uh, the catenary, like uh, Robert Hooke developed for uh, the structural dome, the inner dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, more popularly by Gaudi for his hanging models for the Colonia Guell, and then in for shells, of course, by Heinz Isler. Um, but the question is, how how would you make them? Because Isler made them most efficiently with uh, yeah reusable laminated timber formworks, uh, but you don't. Even those you don't see today. Um, if you if you look at um, uh, this is Google Engram, so how much does the word shell structure, concrete shell, appear in 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 publications? And you kind of see after the seventies, uh, everything before is kind of considered golden era of of concrete shells, and after uh, uh, the, even the words uh, came in in, in disuse. Uh, which have to do with how you know how do you make these things in a modern context, and and then the question does three D printing of concrete uh, provide a possible way to do so? Um, we went a little bit beyond the catenary and also thought about like how could the material be thickened towards the base so that it's stressed e equally under its self weight. Um, there were some uh, some people who who published about it in parallel on what this shape is and how to define it. Mathematically, we use that as the basis for a parametric model to to design like different configurations and sizes uh, of of faults um, using this logic. And just to give you an idea of this this uh, this parametric model, starting from a perimeter shape and then some selected positions for uh, the supports to then carve this up into uh, sections that would form the, the basis of the shells, then map onto this, this, this mathematical shape for a constant stress arch. 
and then mesh this for analysis. So using this shape to, to look at snow loads and, 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 and wind loads. Uh, we were ultimately only able to, to print a single uh, module. Uh, this was done by Vertigo as part of the house, house, house printers, the house printers. Vertigo is a startup in Eindhoven. Uh, not so much a startup, it's quite big now. Um, what I think is very new about this thing is that we, we decided to print it vertically. So the printing lines, ultimately, so yeah, the, the elements are put upright. And so the printing line, this was practical for many reasons, but it's also nice aesthetically that these printing lines follow roughly the flow of forces in these things. Uh, it's a double layered shell. The idea was to have uh, for it to be monolithic, a constant stress arch, maybe that the concrete itself would be uh, insulating or lightweight. Uh, for this prototype, didn't quite get that far. So we printed these two sections with uh, internal ribs. And then some final, final impressions made out of uh, eight pieces. Um, quite, quite simple. So this is the, yeah, the, the printing, then uh, just standard uh, formwork elements to, to make uh, the formwork or guide work. Um, lower each of these segments into it. It all comes together in the center. And after decentering, um, you see the formwork on the right, not that much. And then some, some framing, you know, final result. So uh, that's that's it. That's four four projects that we've we've done over the past uh, few years. Um... Thank you very much, Eric. <clears throat> um, um, maybe the students have some questions. Yeah, Rob. Hi, thank you very much. It was uh, really good and, you know, they're really cool projects, really inspiring. So really nice to see. And I thought the presentation was really good too, especially the, um, you know, zooming in on Google Earth to show location. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I have, well, I have a lot of questions, but I will I'll bore you with only one, I have one or two of them. Um, I suppose it's more of a 3D printing, uh, you know, concrete question, but mm. it was about the, it, was it limitations to size as to the, you know, the final shell was split and also the bridge was split and then pre-stressed yeah. it, you know, would yeah. it, would it have been nicer to, to try and get rid of that pre-stress or thanks. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, both, both were bound by size and the idea of, of printing offsite, right. In a controlled, uh, factory environment. Um, yeah, if you look at people working on 3D printing concrete, you see both, uh, both ideas, printing on-site with a large gantry or large uh, arm or off-site in, in segments. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily advocate for either. I think they both have a role for depending on the application. But as soon as you decide to print off-site, then you're, you're, you're well, off-site as well. You're, 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 you're constrained by the bounding box of your machine. People try to print off-site on mobile robots or gantries or, or large arms to kind of uh, get rid of that constraint. But in a factory, for sure, you could do the same lo long track. Um, but but yeah, uh, this is also early early days. Uh, as early days, uh, I mean, first academic work was maybe 20 years ago. But commercial 3D concrete printing in the Netherlands has been uh, something like five to 10 years. Um, so people start with mm -hmm. with buying a single robotic arm, building a, a, a gantry, uh, maybe then buying a track. So the bounding box of your elements becomes bigger and bigger, but you're still constrained. And people also try at the same time to push the limit and, and print bigger things. So you're always hitting these limits. Um, the pre-stressing in the bridge, uh, it's, it's what we try to resolve in this pavilion a bit by showing how to uh, design and build something that does not require reinforcement or pre-stressing. Um, for the bridges, um, well, there's a, re a recent uh, project in the Venice Biennale by my former research group, block research group, the Striatus Bridge, together with Saadi, that, that kind of also tries to do the same thing, segments, mm -hmm. but no reinforcement or pre-stressing. Um, but this bridge in Nijmegen, it followed the sequence and, and, and has been followed by several other bridges here where, where the thought is to kind of stick to this idea of, of 
making these these uh, pre-stressed segments. The segments also mean that if the supports are stiff, then each individual segment is a simply supported statically determinate structure, which kind of helps evaluating because they do quite sophisticated um, analysis in, in software like Diana, which is similar to uh, maybe more well-known uh, Abacus, but Diana is a Dutch, Dutch competitor. Uh, but, but before you even start doing those kind of things, it's good to be able to do calculations on paper or more simple software and having a simply supported, uh, pre-stressed statically determined structure kind of helps with these things. It, it, it limits the engineering risk in something that is already so complicated. So it might be that over time you, you can kind of move away from this, but in, in these kind of high stakes, government funded infrastructural projects, uh, even though you're pushing technology, there's a, uh, it's still risk averse in, in many ways. And, and so that, that's kind of where, where this pre-stressing is coming from. Well, thank you very much. And it sounds like a kind of an exciting corner to continue in. Appreciate it. Um, can you hear me? Uh, did Eric? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, I changed Sorry. my uh, headphones. Okay, so um, any other question? So in the meantime, um, so the other, uh, but all these uh, bridges, how do they compare in cost to, to other um, standard concrete manufacturing techniques? I, I think um so i haven't been involved in the recent ones so i'm assuming there's a lot of optimization but this so what i can only speak of is this bridge and i i would definitely say it's not competitive in any sense if you look at the size even though it's i believe still the longest as it was at the time but i still think it is the longest pedestrian bridge uh made in this way in the world like free concrete printing but it's still modest still pedestrian bridge and you you could easily argue why why not make this thing in timber? Uh, in fact, it replaced uh, a timber bridge that was at the end of its life, so it had to be replaced, and so thought it was a good opportunity. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is is that 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 this bridge is also a technological stepping stone. It is not an end game. It's not trying to say, yeah, at least course. to me, it's not trying to say let's all print three D. Uh, uh, 3D concrete print uh, pedestrian bridges everywhere, uh, but it's still a technology that everybody's exploring. It 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 most definitely I feel has its place. We there's many things many things that are built where it's hard to move away from concrete, where it's preferable to use concrete. Uh, but the way we're doing it with traditional formworks, for sure, it can be done more efficiently in 3D concrete printing um so i i think i think it's yeah we're still trying to kind of find find these these places where where um it's most valuable and there i'm convinced it is competitive it's competitive to alternatives um for this bridge in particular no it's not it's not competitive okay and, and actually what you were uh pre-stressing was just the upper part right post mc so, so the legs are traditionally reinforced, uh, okay. kind of rigid with their uh, foundation, and then these individual five segments are are pre-stressed, yeah, in in kind of the upper part because it's it's in, it's inclined. We we did talk about um, more like funicular, like shell action, and we did talk about like curved reinforcement, uh, but but these are like these are all like piling on more complexities on, on something that, that was already quite difficult to, to achieve. Um, at the same time, things are go moving so fast that like every, it's almost like every day you see some new 3D concrete printing project from some country or some company or some uh, university. Uh, but but yeah, it's, it's uh, at the time we were definitely trying and, and it did realize several things that had not been done before. Yeah. Congratulations on this. Um, any other question? And okay, um, just just something very very technical. 
in the in the first uh, grid show, um, the contractor uh, was still doing the the, the dovetail. So, sorry, the dovetail, the, the slotted holes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Even though he was not building it flat, he was still. Uh, oh, uh, oh, that uh, you, that's what you mean. Uh, I I have to be honest. I I'm not sure if they drilled them on site or did the or prefabricated the the slotted holes. So th this is this is really the unfortunate thing where we're so poorly uh, informed yeah. ab about how it was constructed that that most of the things we know is because we asked we bothered <laughs> to ask afterwards, uh, but we just ha we handed off these documents that were all done for uh, for feasibility for permitting, and then the it kind of like just stopped and then suddenly they were building it and uh, yeah uh, this whole thing happened. Um, which which happens a lot in traditional construction, right? You have a, a design phase until permitting, and then a te and then it's tendered out, and somebody else does does the rest. Um, but it was yeah. very unusual to go into a process like this for for uh, s something uh, that's so unusual as a as a timber grid show. And and sorry, the, the, I have no the remember the 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 arcs were uh, planner were to the to the uh, planner of uh, glue line beams uh the edges yes they're, they're twisting a bit they're they're okay. they're twisting yeah yeah we right. we were aware that this was kind of like very difficult to do we did bother to look in europe like who had already done that so we provided them with a list of companies but the contractor did find uh a swedish company that that uh okay. <laughs> that seemed to have very little difficulty in making them so. yeah no, 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 normally we get this uh no, like the suddenly passing from a totally planner to a slightly twisting no? can yeah. have a drastic change in, in price no? and normally you have to have yeah. this uh, trade-off between like better geometry or like yeah. better manufacturing yeah if, if i remember correctly they, they are like uh, they are planar uh we made them planar during the form finding but they they twist because you want them to follow the, yeah, uh, the, the curvature tangent. of the surface yeah. so even though it's it's like in a plane this this thing still twists along that 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 plane okay. yeah yeah oh yeah i think it, it, it turned out uh, beautiful so congratulations on this and and i i think i think i i agree with rob um the the animations uh express very well now these variations i think it's it's very communicative and very useful for both the the um, the clients and the contractors no all the other possibilities no? mm. the, the design space you can have and the range of, of things you can touch so i think it's, yeah. it's very good so you you do i guess everything this in, in house no yeah with mm -hmm. the videos i I'm, i really make myself uh Great. including the editing and, and finding music and um uh they're all generated from grasshopper the frames right. um uh clearly i'm not reinventing the wheel a lot of the no. like style of it is 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 based on what you see from from like top universities when they make a new pavilion they all have this amazing material i i don't see this enough happening in practice and it's it's it's, it's such a good idea I'd, there's so much even even the most um uh I know traditional looking structure they've they've, they've so much yeah, so many stories to tell and nobody to tell them and uh, yeah uh, so i i try whenever i can for for certain projects to do something yeah right i think it's very very uh, i mean it's i think it's very uh valid or um you capitalize the effort no, by uh, sitting you know, one 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 morning and, and making the whole uh, the effort of of rendering so of, of visualizing the the video yeah i i uh, i enjoy making them and they're they're certainly useful to to present my work and and for a lecture like this uh but i can already tell you if you make if you if you're yeah working on let's say a timber grid shell you make a video do not make the mistake of thinking when i put this video out there then the orders for more timber grid yeah. shells come pouring in there's nobody knocking down my door asking me to do another one yeah. Uh, so it's so it's it's a, a lot of you have to kind of do these things also for for like personal satisfaction and, and just, uh, wanting to kind of share the work a little bit yeah. how is the engram in in grid shows because the... <laughs> i haven't checked <laughs> maybe okay. we should let's see if it's the slow yeah. ascending yeah. or not yeah, yeah. It, the, um guys do you have any other question uh yeah um 
Thank you, Derek. It was a very nice uh, lecture. I would like to ask you about the design process. How do you guys uh, come across with the concepts? Um, how um, or how long is it takes for for you to create a concept and then modeling and then like uh, you know find the suppliers and all this kind of uh, you know the process in general behind the projects? Mm. Yeah. So um, the tricky thing compared to uh to uh, let's say an academic environment is that you're limited in the hours that you can spend on something because of a limited budget. And so most design phases, if you're lucky, and like, uh, let's say you, you have a, a preliminary design stage and then a final design stage and you do permitting and then you have maybe technical design for maybe tendering and then maybe uh, an execution design phase of so four design phases uh, for something like as randomly crazy as as we do, it's, it's difficult to put a number on it. But but I'd say you you we, we are lucky if we can. Well, we we have to spend something like four or five weeks per phase, and you're lucky to to be paid uh, something like that. Um, people often clients don't realize when they when they want something uh, complicated, even though it's small, that that the amount of time invested in design and engineering at the at, at the start is 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 it is in proportion to the building cost is, is very mm -hmm. different from let's say a large large uh, conventional building uh so I, I do run into these issues but it it it, it influences the work so it, it that does uh come back to your question like how do i approach these things um every project is different um in the timber grid shell I was working with friends from the start and we were working together. We were all uh, computationally able, uh, similar background, similar knowledge. And so we could move quite fast on something that we were all, uh, 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 yeah, we all stood behind. Um, the project in the Philippines, it was given designs from uh, an artist from the Philippines and two designers from Rotterdam. And it was more, uh, I had very little influence on the uh, total design. And we, we were, I was more in a traditional of a stru structural engineer working on like detailed design or, or saying this has to change. There's no other way, not because of architecture, aesthetics or functionality, no, because uh, the analysis shows it has to change. Um, also, um, uh, just referring to projects now, I have two people. One, one is uh, Aitor, I saw he's also, I think he's also looking now. At the lecture, um, so Aitor, who, who came from your school, he, he's working on a 30 meter high observation tower, and I have another uh, another guy at our office, Anand, he's working on a 30 meter high uh, observation tower, uh, but they're totally different projects because in one, the one that Aitor is working on, we've we've been involved before there was an initial concept, so we we've really worked with the two architecture firms on designing and, and guiding uh, what would work in, in many respects, also structural. Um, it's all uh, parametrically modeled. Uh, but the other tower, we were there was a given design and we needed to make it work. And so we, we were, again, in a traditional engineering role, didn't have much influence, trying to find variations in, with, in much smaller design space. So I, I, I generally tend to see uh, a lot of value in 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 being part of a project from the start but i often generally don't have the luxury of being involved at the start and i'm only brought in quite late uh when they're trying to make a design work or asking the question for the first time is this structurally feasible <clears throat> yeah cool thanks Guys, any, any other question? Yeah, I, I think you're right, no? They're saying uh, sometimes you're, you're lucky to get paid, no? So sometimes it's hard to convince a client that some parts are really value, valuable, no? And especially in, in this case, no, where you have to put a lot of effort at the beginning, no? And, and especially the case of, of, of sizes, no? So it's totally scaleless, no? So something very small uh, mm -hmm. and, and for a small budget can may need like a lot, almost the same uh, energy uh, than, than something uh, brutally uh, larger. 
So indeed, it's 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 part of the the challenge, huh? right? To, to to be able to to be doing these uh, very interesting, uh, geometrically um, interesting uh, projects, huh? and still be 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 commercially possible, not so have a viability in the in the um, in the business. So I think congratulations for this. Um, to give this like very nice uh, project uh, list. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, when I started five years ago, I didn't know where this was going. It was always uh, an experiment, kind of still is. Um, I mean, there, there's we're definitely doing different things than, than other firms uh, here in the Netherlands. And um, uh, it, it, it's it's a conscious choice, uh, not, not not financially the best. Uh, it's it's always difficult to 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 make everything work. It does. It does. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of trading off between projects. Uh, we do bigger bigger things where it's more reasonable to ask higher fees. We do smaller things. Uh, sometimes we 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 do a small part. Some sometimes we do a lot. Um, uh, we also um, we also apply for grants a lot. Some of these projects. Uh, so the, the the last one, the the one with. Uh, with the, the vaulted pavilion um that's all funded by dutch government grants so so this group of companies along with us they apply for grants to to investigate this uh it pays a reasonable fee but uh it, it's a it's a big chunk of money for this consortium to over a longer period develop something so we we definitely re also rely on on these kind of things to to make it all work yeah of course okay <laughs> um okay then, then thank you very much for the lecture and your and, and your thoughts um you're welcome hopefully we can invite you next time in the future editions with the master and uh, thank you very much you're welcome it's nice uh, nice to be invited um uh hope it was uh interesting useful to everyone 